Now let's shift gears, sir, and, 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 right. and, and, and to pick your uh, powerful brain on these issues. One of the leading constitutional scholars out there, Dr. Edwin Vieira, joins us right now, if you just uh, tuned in. Just, I want to get your take on the overall atmosphere, if you're shocked by it. Because I was expecting this, but still, to, it's one thing to know it's coming, but to see it happen. Uh, the, the Violent Belligerence Act that clearly states, you know, in the text, we've shown it here probably a hundred times the last two months, it's, it's it, very close to passing, where it says if the Army or the Justice Department wants you, you disappear for even any intelligence purpose, and only an act of Congress can even discover where you are. Uh, you've got Cass Sunstein saying we can shut down free speech, tax free speech, make people carry what information we want in their newspapers or websites. You've got Elena Kagan, and I've got the quotes, you know, basically saying we can ban any speech we want, we can go after the Second Amendment. I mean, these people, uh, they're running around saying we'll put you on a secret list with no fly, no buy, you can't own guns. Uh, they've got Republicans supporting that. Uh, the end of habeas corpus, I mean, it's just... It's just uh, the Supreme Court just ruled, you know, uh, uh, no rights for detainees, indefinite detention. I, I mean, it, it, it's it's just for me as a layman, but somebody who studied the Bill of Rights, Constitution, and history, is this not the most Orwellian system we could imagine? I think Stalinist is actually the word for it. As I suppose it's Orwellian in the sense that uh, Orwell wrote fiction, and we're looking at something which is so extraordinarily difficult to believe that it could even happen at all, let alone that it's happening so quickly. And if you look at the, the rise of the, the, the uh, police state mechanism, 9-11, uh, the Patriot Act, the Military Commissions Act, and now there's various things that you're talking about. Well, how long has this been? Right? A decade? How quickly has this country degenerated? And the amazing thing to me is the, the uniformity of opinion among Democrats, Republicans, in the, in the court system, in the media. Uh, the orchestration of this is what really, I shouldn't say shocks me, but it just surprises me how, how well the wheels have been greased to move this forward at a very rapid speed, much faster uh, than I certainly would have predicted, but I think it's primarily because the economic system is deteriorating much faster than most of us would have predicted. Well said. I mean, when I really lay in bed and I'm thinking about this, I ask myself, how do I hear a UT law professor saying the health care bill's constitutional on local radio and out of his mouth next he says, stripping us of habeas corpus is good, and the guy was supposedly a liberal. I mean, this guy isn't a liberal. He's not a conservative. He's a tyrant. He's a danger to us all. Yeah, and it's the consistency among these people on both sides of the so-called political spectrum, once again proving that the political spectrum that they present to us is essentially fictional. It's there for another purpose. It doesn't really represent a dichotomy in the views of the people on that side of the yellow line, if you will. They all have essentially the same view, which to use, I think, the correct word is basically totalitarian. They're going to tell us what to do and to hell with us, basically. They don't intend to listen to us. We are supposed to listen to them. And everything that's coming out, now it's amazing that uh, Cass Sunstein is a good example. It's coming out of Harvard Law School, because I attended Harvard. And it was a pretty liberal place even in my day. Uh, and it's become quite a bit more liberal since then. That was back in the 1970s. And here's a professor at Harvard Law School who is blatantly promoting the suppression of political speech. It was incredible. And broad. He didn't just pick out the Nazis to set the precedent. He said, arrest someone if they say anthropogenic global warming is a fraud. That's right. So how far, how far does this go? Well, it goes to the Stalinist point that if you say essentially anything that's against the regime, the NKVD will show up at 3 o'clock in the morning and you'll disappear into the gulag. And now I turn CNN on and they've got Lieberman and McCain going, we want to be able to secretly arrest you. <laughs> Uh, and uh, uh, strip you of your citizenship. Yes. All right, let's take that next step, right? Strip you of your citizenship. So that now, theoretically, all sorts of rights disappear. As a, simply as a consequence of that. Now, of course, if people want to be stripped of citizenship, and I think that's unconstitutional as a, in principle. But if you were to accept that principle, it would strike me that the first people on that list would be these public officials who have violated their oath to the Constitution of the United States. Well, they do. I mean, they do work for the foreign powers of the banking cartel. Dr. Evan Vieira, our amazing guest, will be right back after this quick break to continue and talk about Elena Kagan.
Next segment, we're going to uh, Bud, one of his military stories out of Katrina. Dr. Edwin Vieira is with us for the rest of the hour. Elena Kagan, I mean, what is this psychological tactic where they just throw everything in our face? Are they trying to break our will, Doctor? Because here she is, never even been a judge. Uh, well, they admit lawyer. She was never a litigator, for instance, but she has very little experience in the court system. But then the, the papers we do have from the University of Chicago Law Review and others, I mean, this is Stalinistic. She, she's a chip off the old Cass Sunstein uh, block. Give us your breakdown on Elena Kagan. Well, I think that's exactly it. There's a certain, uh, certain mentality there that's expressed in, in what she's written. Uh, the interesting little vignette that came to me, she was uh, a law clerk at the Supreme Court for Justice Blackman. And a case came up involving the uh, a sub Second Amendment question. And she wrote uh, a little memo to him saying that the case shouldn't, certiorari shouldn't be granted and the case, Supreme Court shouldn't hear it, because she was not sympathetic to the issue. And I thought, well, that's an amazing attitude. Uh, whether or not an individual law clerk or a justice is sympathetic, personally sympathetic to a constitutional question, decides whether these questions are going to be heard. Well, that would strike me as really a disqualification in terms of their, just their psychological propensities, if you will, for dealing with this type of problem. But then you look at the background, you look at what she's advocated, at least what she's in print as having advocated, uh, and I would say that the very, very bad decision... Uh, to put her on the court, but it's, you know, it's, it's of a piece of what's coming out of the Obama administration. Well, I mean, well, everything let me, they do is a, 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 of this type. Well, again, just watching Supreme Court nominations over the decades, that's the number one thing, that they're impartial and that they're going to follow the Constitution. But here she is admitting, oh, I, I decide cases on what... Uh, what I believe in, and we know she's a gun grabber, and so that memo right there, she should be disqualified. And I think that's the attitude of uh, the now Justice Sotomayor as well. I mean, she would express the opinion that, well, judges make law. Well, what does that mean when you're in a constitutional context? I take it that means that she thinks that she can make or unmake uh, different provisions of the Constitution, which is clearly contrary to the whole theory of constitutional jurisprudence. Well, why even have a Congress if, why even have a president if the Supreme Court can do everything for us? Well, that's right. They become the, the super legislature, in fact, superior to Congress because they can write uh, constitutional decisions that, according to them, control what Congress can do. To put themselves in a fantastic position, in fact, superior to the people because of the people to change the Constitution, we have to go through the rather involved process under Article 5 of getting all of those three quarters of the states through their legislatures or conventions, to agree to some constitutional change. Whereas in the Supreme Court, five votes out of nine does it. Plus, if they say the Constitution is whatever they say it is, it doesn't matter if we pass an amendment. They would just basically exercise a veto. Yeah, that's exactly right. They, they may tell us what the, our amendment means, and it may be something quite different from, we th from what we thought it meant. But, but let's go back to the psychological question, the hubris or, 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 or the arrogance. Why would they bring somebody forward who is the worst candidate that I've ever seen in history for the Supreme Court. I mean, she has no qualifications. Well, number one, she's going to be there for a very long time. They want their kind of person there, and so she fits, and she fits from the point of view of ideology. Uh, and maybe also it's to show us that they can get away with anything they want to uh, in very brazen fashion because she is relatively outspoken uh, in terms of these the ideological proclivities. So you add all of that up. But I think the real reason was uh, she's uh, someone who's going to be there quite a long time, and she fits the ideological mold perfectly, and she's apparently perfectly willing to exercise that ideology no matter what the Constitution may say. Do, it, it, but doesn't this just further discredit the court? Uh, well, yes, I guess it does, but you tell me whether the court hasn't already been discredited beyond salvation at this point in time. I mean, I spent years litigating cases in the Supreme Court before uh, uh, Sotomayor or, or Kagan came on uh, the court, and I, I learned a long time ago that we were not going to restore the uh, constitutional foundations of this republic through the Supreme Court of the United States. So what do we do? We have the constitutional crisis. It's happened before, as you know, where the Congress, because it controls the money, starts really exercising power, and what, cuts the money off to them? I mean, what do you do? Well, to go through the states, number one, because it has to be a legislative solution here, and not a judicial solution. As a practical matter, it's just too difficult to bring uh, large numbers of these issues through the judicial system. It just takes too long, and then the courts try to limit the, the extent of the 
questions that are presented, and then they give you opinions that are uh, insufficient, whatever. Uh, it has to be a, a legislative solution, and it has to come through the states because Congress right now is a wasteland. I think you will end up with a constitutional crisis. You're going to come uh, uh, up to a situation where some significant number of states are taking one route and, and Congress, perhaps backed by some of the other states, are taking another route, and the people are going to have to weigh in on one side or the other, and we can just keep our fingers crossed it'll be on the right side. I agree. This was a short segment, long segment coming up. He writes for newswithviews.com. Got a lot of great books. We'll tell you about some of those, how you can get them and educate yourself before he leaves us. And he's also, I think, one of the most powerful presenters uh, in Don't Tread on Me, Rise of the Republic, available on DVD at Infowars.com. And you will see it first on the web this afternoon, coming up in a few hours, at PrisonPlanet.tv. We'll be right back.